to celebrate its 40th anniversary, we bring you an irreverent take on the last 40 years of the network. Containing some strong language from the start, Stephen Fry and Matt Lucas present Radio 4. This is your life. the actor, writer and bon viveur Stephen Fry. There has been, you know, one British institution that has influenced me above all others. And it was while I was detained there that I began listening <laughs> to Radio 4, the UK's most loved, admired and respected radio station after Radio 2. <laughs> and so... I'm honoured tonight to be standing outside a branch of Waitrose in the tiny village of Middle England where Radio 4 is currently shopping. I'm, uh, I'm going to surprise him by whisking him off to the radio theatre at Broadcasting House in London's West End where friends, family, listeners and programmes are gathered for a night he'll never forget. He's at the checkout. Let's, uh, let's go and meet him. Cashback? Oh, I should say so. I'm seeing John Humphreys now for an hour. He'll only be paid in used twenties. Did you see Radio 4? Yes, oh dear. Look, I don't know the rules to Mornington Crescent, and we're not bringing back the UK thing, okay? Now, <laughs> please, get up. Oh, it's you, Stephen! <laughs> you thought you'd come here to do your weekly shop. Yeah, these scratch cards aren't mine, and uh, nor is the Nuts magazine. But, Radio 4, this is no ordinary week. Forty years ago, the cultural life of Great Britain changed forever because you came into being. Yes, that's right. Tonight, BBC Radio 4... Oh, my God! I can't believe it! Oh, I just... Oh, my God! Oh, you've got the big red book and everything! <laughs> I have a car waiting outside. Oh, can I bring these dairy lunchables to eat on the way? <laughs> Let's go, because tonight, BBC Radio 4, this is your life! <laughs> My listeners were so young. <laughs> People out there barely out of their 70s. Yes. <laughs> Look at him. Oh, sorry, madam. Sorry. No, it's the beard. Sorry. So welcome, one and all, to the radio theatre. Oh, is this going out after the watershed? Oh, yes. Oh, thank fuck for that. <laughs> no, no, sorry, everyone. Sorry. It's just that when I get excited, I've got a mouth like Tony Blair. Well, trouble yourself with potty language not a jot longer as we begin our evening of celebration. We begin... At the beginning. And so it was on September the 30th, 1967, that you went on the airwaves. I wonder if you remember your very first words. Here they are. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the exciting new sound of BBC Radio 4. And now for our very first programme, Feedback with Roger Bolton. <laughs> And it seems the last 12 seconds of broadcasting have really touched a nerve with you at home. <laughs> Mr. Cutler from Cinderford writes, I have been a dedicated listener to Radio 4 for over 18 seconds now. <laughs> but my goodness, the drop in quality over the last nine and a half seconds has been pitiful to behold. The home service used to be so much better and more intelligent. Stop dumbing down, BBC. But not all the letters were so complimentary. <laughs> Mrs. Diamond from Peasmarsh. In its first five seconds on air, Radio 4 has sunk to all new low. The first two pips were fine, but the third pip was one of the most sickeningly offensive things <laughs> that you have ever broadcast. <laughs> Sir, I had the distinct misfortune to have been in a room with my dearest wife when this perversion came on. To spare her delicate foal-like ears from the rubbish spewing from the radio, I had no choice but to kill her. <laughs> her blood is on your hands, BBC, and on my tweed seersucker suit. Do keep your letters coming in. From the very first edition of Feedback, goodbye. <laughs> Memories to you there, Radio Forum, from one famous first to another. 
Do you remember this noise? <laughs> Recognise that? Yes, yes, that's the first ever buzz used on a Radio 4 quiz show. You're right. Now, that first game show was a somewhat simple affair. Hello, and welcome to Who Will Press Their Buzzer First After the Ping? I am Mr. Frewisher. My guests are Mr. Stevenson. Hello. <laughs> I am delighted to be on the Who Will Press Their Buzzer First After the Ping radio program, Mr. Frobisher. And Mr. Preston. Hello. <laughs> Which one of these eager fellows will be first to press their buzzer after the ping? <laughs> we are about to find out. <laughs> Please put your fingers on your buzzers and wait for the ping. <laughs> When you hear the ping, please press your buzzer. For one who presses their buzzer first, after the ping, is the person who will win the game. Of who will press their buzzer first, after the ping. Are you ready to play? Who will press their buzzer first, after the ping? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Preston, you were the first to press your buzzer after the ping. You have won. I'm much obliged to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Marvellous show, so simple. After four years, we even allowed female panellists on it. Mm. Sadly, as the game became more popular, the fans became more obsessive. In one nasty incident, buzzer hooligans stormed the studio and Mr. Frobisher was kicked to death. Yes. <laughs> well, never mess with the Radio 4 audience. No, no. Now, Radio 4, you were the eldest of four children. Yes, there were, of course, your siblings, Radios 1, 2 and 3. Three, yes. Life was hard. You were all squeezed into one wave band. Oh, yes, yes. I remember Radio 1 was always very immature. Still is. Then you and Radio 3 were the only ones to go to university. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the others didn't even manage an O-level. No. Uh, mind you, Radio 1 was having fun, and I remember being awfully jealous. I mean, the late Tony Blackburn, God rest his soul. No, I, I think, um, I think he's still alive. Is he? Crikey. Well, his, his hair still seems to be growing, so we should assume it. I, I, I remember he had this marvellous barking dog called Arnold. Do you remember that? <laughs> woof, woof, he used to go. Bloody hilarious! Oh, oh, oh I loved it. Inspirational. In mm. fact, for my early news bulletins, I tried something similar. BBC Radio 4, here is the news. <laughs> Tom next time announces it has the h bomb. <laughs> American planes attack Hanoi. <laughs> And will someone please get this elephant out of my face? <laughs> but, but also, like Radio 1, you began life as a pirate station. Oh, right? yes, absolutely, yes, pirate radio station. Yeah, Radio 1, as we know, was a copy of stations like Radio Caroline that used to broadcast from derelict, rusting hulls. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to Simon Hoggart in a moment. <laughs> well, but the BBC, of course, heard these fun and trendy stations, and the decision was taken to compete. So, so the prototype for Radio 4 came from a ship moored somewhere off the coast of Essex. A ship? Oh, good grief, no. No, we had a delightful little punt on the riverbank in Henley-on-Thames. Yeah. A lot of our early presenters were pirate punts, as we called them, yes. Neddy Sherin, Joni Bakewell, even Nicky Parsons, who back then was only in his early 90s, yes. <laughs> yes. Crazy times. But then, then the BBC poached all that talent. Oh, yes. And not just the talent. Robert Robinson, too. Ah. I bid you good evening. In those days, he was a wild man. And an extra point for being so clever. Always playing jokes on the other presenters. Mm. Once, for the laugh, and I remember this very clearly, he and Humphrey Littleton snuck into Radio 3 late at night and hid its entire audience. <laughs> yeah, they still hadn't found it. So, you know, 
Radio 4, amongst the dross and the drivel, there have been some truly magnificent orators on your glorious network over the decades. Normally, on these occasions, one says that no single person stands out. Well, Stephen, I think I know where this is going. Because yeah. one individual does stand, like a colossus. He shines like a beacon, radiates like Chernobyl. Mm, I know, I know. He's the biggest star on the network. The audience adore him, and he gets more fan mail and knickers through the post than any other Radio 4 star. Oh, it's not who I thought, then. <laughs> I'm talking about the financial reporter's financial reporter. He is, of course, the presenter of Moneybox, Paul Lewis. Oh, <laughs> lovely Paul, magnificent Paul, all hail to the Lewis. Yes, now you spotted Paul when he was just a humble checkout girl for little. <laughs> what was it that made you think this, this is the young lad who can change the face of financial advice phone-ins forever? Stephen, in a word, it was sex. Mm. Raw, visceral sex. I mean, anyone can work out the likely payout of a pension based on current earnings, assuming a net growth of 7% per annum and a retirement age of 65. Can they? Can they? Yes, but I wanted a boy who could do that and stir something in the loins. Mm. A young kid with a sense of rhythm. A boy who could swivel his hips, that is to say, home information packs, and have the girls crying into their credit card bills. And thus, Moneybox Mania was born. And is it true that next month Primark introduces the Paul Lewis collection? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm wearing one of his thongs right now. Are oh, you? <laughs> well... Unfortunately, Radio 4, Paul can't be with us tonight because Whoa. he's currently in Hollywood filming the story of his life, The Money Boxer, <laughs> co-starring, of course, Louise Botting and Vincent Duckleby. But he did send this message. Oh, lovely. It's me, Paul, over here by my pool in L.A. Sorry I couldn't be there tonight, but, hey, I'm showing a couple of supermodels around my maxi ice if you know what I'm saying. But I remember that I owe it all to you, Radio 4. And remember... You only have nine months to decide which of your child trust fund options you're going for. And you can give your children a max yes, of 3 k a year. Okay. Somebody it stop it, Paul Lewis. Paul Lewis. <laughs> it was sexy, but it was financial pornography. Yeah. Really. Yeah. <laughs> One of your... Um... One of your flagship current affairs programmes is Any Questions. It began life way back in 1948 on the home service, of course, and was quite a different show from the one we know today. Yes, and it even had a different title. It was called The Nuremberg Trial. Hmm. <laughs> But by 1951, it was renamed, How Dare You Ask Me Any Questions, I'm a Member of His Majesty's Government. <laughs> but down the years, one thing has been crucial to the show's enduring success. It's the toe-curlingly twee, tongue-in-cheek final question asked by a member of the audience and designed to reassure listeners that in spite of war, corruption and genocide, the world is really rather jolly. Yeah. <laughs> the first of these was aired in April 1949. I would like to ask the panel, if you were a Russian book, what would be at the top of your list? Powdered banana or a tin of spam? Well, as you can imagine, there is the fiercest competition amongst would-be contributors to that final tweet question. Each year, thousands of hopefuls armed with their light-hearted questions audition for Jonathan Dimbleby in a selection process called the Twee Factor. <laughs> now, sadly, archive of these auditions still exists. <laughs> Next. <clears throat> sorry, sorry. I'm just really nervous. Come on, <clears throat> we haven't got all day. No, no. Right, my question is... If the panel members uh, were pieces of fruit, what colour fruit bowl would the fruit... No, no, sorry, not, not fruit bowl. Uh, no, that's it. If the fruit were put in a blender, which fruit smoothie flavour would the panel be? Pathetic. Barry, that wasn't nearly twee enough. <laughs> Next. My name's Cathy and, and I'm from Romford. Um, <clears throat> um, if you was a mole on a politician's neck... Which politician's neck would you be on? And would you be malignant? <laughs> Young lady, you are going to be on Radio 4. Why? I don't believe you! Mum, I'm going to be on Radio 4! <laughs> no, not Chris That Boyle. Jimbleby is such a tough judge. Yes, and his trousers are pulled up way too high. <laughs> <laughs> now, I believe it was in 1974 that you first met... Peter White. Oh, yes, dear old Peter, lovely <laughs> Peter. Who's here again? 
<laughs> Peter, of course, presents many specialist programs for you. Oh, yes, he's the black chap. Uh, no, but don't tell him. <laughs> oh. uh, among, among other minority interest programs, he famously presents Out of Step, the magazine show especially designed to cater for the needs and issues of listeners with no sense of timing. <laughs> let's, um, let's hear a clip. And now on Radio 4, it's time for... Hello, this week... Out of Step. <laughs> Sorry. With Peter White. Hello. This week, we'll be looking at the latest range of metronomes available on the NHS, reporting on the progress of our campaign to criminalise karaoke, and asking why unsynchronised and partially unsynchronised people are still discriminated against by organisations such as the Royal Ballet and Air Traffic Control. <laughs> it's all coming earlier, but uh, after that, I have with me today the President... It's been a pleasure. So, until next week... Well, I'm very glad you asked me that. And that's all we've got time for. Hello. Do you find, like me, that your condition worsens when you talk to a fellow sufferer? Oh, it's lovely to be here. Of the League for the Differently Chronologically Orientated? I think the answer is yes, I definitely do and this is a case in point. As a, as a young radio station, were you very bothered by the rival in the shape of that vulgar upstart, television? Oh, Stephen, television was terrible. Terrible, 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 terrible. Terrible. Mm. Yes. Uh, and this was before Ross Kemp was even born. Yes. I mean, RTV had launched back in 1955, and in 1967 the BBC was starting to show programmes in colour. We realised that we needed something huge to compete, so plans were made to create a diversion. And someone had to plan to bump off one of our best-loved heroines. Yes, Grace Archer. No, Sue McGregor. <laughs> there, there was a rumour that you even tried broadcasting in colour yourself. Yes, ridiculous idea. That was never going to work. This is Radio 4, remember? Our listeners weren't ready to accept anything that wasn't predominantly white. <laughs> TV was promoted with a series of road shows around the country. Um, did you ever consider a similar sort of stunt? Oh, yes, yes. We had our thought for the day, Big Weekender. Yes, yes. <laughs> Rabbi Lionel Blue, live on stage in Bournemouth with Smiley Miley. Yes, mm. yes. It led directly to the creation of the Radio 1 road shows with the likes of Simon Bates and Mike Reed. Oh, so it was a disaster then? Total. <laughs> well, one of those road show pioneers is here tonight. Oh, no. You haven't seen him since this morning on the Today programme. No. Yes, it's Rabbi Lionel Blue. Oh. Good evening, Radio 4. Good evening, man in the front row. Good evening, woman next to him. Good evening, man sitting next to him. Yeah, all right, Blue. Yeah. Get on with it, yeah. Well, today, I'd like to speak to you on behalf of newsreaders and continuity announcers in distress, or knackered. <laughs> Take the case of a lady who will call Charlotte Green, because that's her name. For as long as anyone can remember, Charlotte has been saying things like... After the news, Pat is worried about her organic yoghurt. <laughs> As if she could actually give a damn. <laughs> and she's been forced to hear sailing by over 15 billion times. <laughs> now, sadly, as a result, Charlotte is, in the words of her doctor, mad as a spoon. In a quarter of an hour, I'm sorry, our correspondence on your farm. And later, Sue McDougalby shows us what's in her gardener's money box. But before that, the archers. And Geoffrey is paying off a pig to keep quiet about their affair. Without your help, Charlotte and dozens like her will live out their lives in confusion in a tiny windowless room that smells of coffee and Peter Donaldson. <laughs> Do please give whatever you can to help them. And that's a bit like Moses who oh, once said... Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Rabbi Lionel Blue. Uh, Radio 4, as we move inexorably towards the present day, we should, of course, mention the one man 
who invented the radio quiz back in 1964 and since then has done his very best to keep them there. <laughs> yes, many of the nation's best-loved quizzes were devised and presented by quizmaster Clive Smug. Oh, Clive Smug! Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Cucumber or banana? Banana or cucumber? Cucumber or banana? Hello and welcome to Banana or Cucumber. I'm your host, Clive Smug, and here are the teams. Barry Cake and Alan Corn on my right. And on my left, Jonathan Porridge and Claire Rainus. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's start with Barry's team. Barry, banana or cucumber? Is it a cucumber? No! Jonathan's team? Is it a banana? Yes! Join us next week for more <laughs> Cucumber or Banana. Now, um, quite surprisingly, that was the most popular quiz of the day. Yes, well, it, it was the only quiz of the day, you see. It ran for 20 years, and when we cancelled the show, a petition signed by over 19,000 angry greengrocers was delivered to number 10. <laughs> What we wanted after that was a completely new show, a break with the past, and Clive came up with the perfect idea. Potato or lemon? <laughs> Potato or lemon ran for a mere seven years. Yes, and you may remember my decision to take it off air meant that questions were asked in the Commons and there were riots in Taunton. <laughs> Of course, the um, distinctive piano music to Cucumber or Banana and Lemon or Potato, indeed all of Radio 4's original musical output, was composed by one man, the man they called Mr. Piano, Ernest Piano. Um, <laughs> sadly, though, he is no longer with us. Yes, it's, it's actually very sad. He was, he was so shocked by the axing of his beloved UK theme that he tragically threw himself off Liz Barclay. <laughs> He has, however, passed the mantle on to his son, who joins us this evening, Roland Piano. You must be immensely proud of your father's fine body of work, Roland. Iconic tunes such as Desert Island Discs, Sailing By and God Rest Its Soul, the UK theme. <laughs> now, of course, the baton's been passed on to you. Indeed, and uh, with Radio 4's help, I'm hoping to make my own musical mark by reviving his lyrical approach. That's right, but we are going to introduce it gradually, starting off with subtle jingles for the big-name presenters. <laughs> The time's coming up to 7.40 You're listening to Today with James Knochty yeah. <laughs> Obviously that is quite specific in that in the, it can only be played at about 20 to 8 mm. <laughs> He can bring a politician to his knees He don't take no shit, John Humphreys <laughs> And my personal favourite He's a wry old wag, Melvin Bragg <laughs> We are, we're also not afraid to shake things up with the existing music. Which brings me to my ambitious remix of the Archers theme. <laughs> Listen up, we got the world's longest running soap. It's the everyday story of country folk. A perfect example of a middle class fiction. Gay civil partnerships and rural drug addiction. Archers! Of all the soaps, it's the most hardcore. The Archers! Every Evening on Radio 4. <laughs> Our journey through your life and times, Radio 4, now washes us ashore onto the beach of the imaginary island envisaged by Roy Plumley when he created Desert Island Discs in 1942. Now, the joy of the programme, of course, is hearing the great and the good of society pretending to love Beethoven's Ode to Joy and <laughs> Debussy's Second Symphony, though we all know the minute they're through the front door, they're dancing in their pants to its raining men by the weather girl. Yes, <laughs> yes it's sheer hypocrisy, sir. That's why, when the delicious Sue Lawley took over in 1988, I tried my best to shake the show up. Since leaving Oxford with a distinguished double first in 1934, Sir Reginald Boring has become one of Britain's most respected ecclesiastical architectural historians of industry. Let's open his cell door. 
Sir Reginald, welcome to Desert Island Discs Extreme. I told you the truth. My favourite records are Beethoven's Ode to Joy and Debussy's Second Symphony. We don't believe you, Sir Reginald. Oh, look, I tell you, it's Beethoven's Ode to Joy and Debussy's Second Symphony. In that case, you leave me no option. Jenny Murray, soften him up. With one of my devastatingly frank and searching questions. I haven't got time for that. <laughs> oh, OK, I'll try something a little quicker. I've heard training from Kate Aidy. Hmm. Ah! Right. All right, it's raining men by the weather, girl! I bloody knew it. That's all from Desert Island Discs Extreme this week. Next week, I'll be jabbing a knitting needle into the Archbishop of Canterbury's luxury item. <laughs> Of course, the undoubted jewel in the crown, the brightest star in the firmament, the Jaffa cake in the biscuit tin of malted milks, is, of course, the Today programme. Oh, undoubtedly so, Stephen, although I never listen myself. Uh, well, why wake up to a discussion about global warming or pension rights when Checkers is on GMTV? <laughs> Pure bliss. Please welcome presenters James Noxley and Sarah Montague. Now, today is a humongous three hours long. Is there really enough news to fill the programme? Before I answer that, I want to say that news and comment is very much at the heart of everything we do. Our priority what is What he means to, put... to say is that it's due in no small measure... I'll have to interrupt you there. We can now go back <laughs> to speak to William Haig in the radio car. <laughs> can you hear me, Mr Haig? No, we don't seem to have him. <laughs> Carry on. I'm sorry, we're right out of time. Although, if I speak fast, I can even tell the listeners for the tenth time about how to find the Today website, discussion forum, and email address, as if they don't know how to use Google. Oh, that's was you are studio production. Back to my buttocks. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Today has been celebrated for the forensic, agenda-setting quality of the political interviews right from the very start. In fact, I believe we have a clip of the very first John Humphreys interview ever. He wasn't quite so bullish in those days. <laughs> There's been disquiet this week at news that the government has approved the disposal of highly unstable radioactive waste in rivers, lakes and children's school lunch boxes. <laughs> well, I'm honoured indeed to have with me now Thomas Price, Minister for Industry. Uh, Mr Price, is there anything you'd like to tell the nation about this? Simply this. There is no need to worry your little heads about it. A large number of exceptionally intelligent, important men, myself included, have made this decision, and you may rest assured we have excellent reasons for doing so. Your wisdom is equalled only by the mellifluousness of your speaking voice. Uh, might I ask you one more question? I think not. I do beg your pardon. Uh, let me turn to Dr. Joseph Craig, who is the chief chemist of the company that produces is the radioactive waste. Um, doctor, as a mere layman, I have no idea what question I should ask you, so would you do me the very great favour of asking yourself uh, whatever question you judge best uh, and then answering it? I could try, but I honestly don't think you or your listeners would understand a word. I'm so sorry, I don't know what came over me then. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, James Nochty, Sarah Montague and John Humphreys. Now, Radio 4, you are, of course, many things to many people. Yes, yes, to yes. some, you're as comfy as a warm bath or a well-worn pair of slippers. Mm. Yet to others, you're as edgy and as dangerous as a warm bath or a well-worn pair of slippers. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I attribute this to my charming and insightful documentaries. Uh, you won't find anything like them on television. It's like the ones about the crofter living on the fourth smallest hill in Scotland, or the Cornish village craftswomen who still make hats the traditional way by luring ships onto the rocks and looting their cargo. <laughs> Precisely. So, first, one needs a remote windswept location. Then, an out-of-breath presenter who will begin by saying... Well, that was quite some trek, but, uh, my goodness, the views make it all worthwhile. He'll then introduce us to... Oh, do? <laughs> Radio 4 staff, Yokel. So, Mr. Yokel, what delightfully quaint thing do you do for a living? Me? 
I'm just doing what my father and his father before him did. I provide the hiss on long wave. <laughs> yes. Well, that's suitably quaint. Do go on. Well, I get up at the crack of dawn for the shipping forecast and farming today, and I starts work like this. <laughs> It's all a matter of getting the pitch just right. A perfectly pitched hiss makes test match special all the more enjoyable. Here, have a listen. And Flintoff is uh, coming in from the pavilion end. See, that is rubbish. Now listen. And Freddy's bold Gilchrist for a duck. <laughs> See, generations of craftspeople. <laughs> You're famous for your innovative, bold, and audacious programming. Oh, uh, am I? It was, uh, it was a Thursday. Oh, yes. Yes. Then we got a complaint, so I cancelled it. Yeah. But we've never been afraid to tackle the issues. For instance, we've catered for disabilities. Ah, that was Does He Take Sugar? Yes. Then there was our program for diabetics. He doesn't take sugar. <laughs> Then our series aimed at all right-thinking people. Please, for God's sake, take Sir Alan Sugar and, and kick, kick him, him up the arse. arse. Yes. Yes. Happy days, happy yes. days. Of course, you yourself, Stephen, are no stranger to my groundbreaking programming. We had record figures on Boxing Day 2000 when you read all of the Harry Potter stories back to back. Oh, yes, the adventures of the young Ron, Harry and Hermione. Sadly, its success wasn't repeated the following year when I did the same thing with the complete works of Andy McNabb. <laughs> Dinger crossed the ground in front of the Iraqi jeeps in double quick time. By the light of the desert moon, we could see two guards. I snuck up behind one of them and jabbed my blade through his filthy foreign ribs. Dinger slotted the other one just as he was lighting up one of his filthy, stinking Arab fags. Then we blew the whole place up with a great big tank. The end. <laughs> Yeah, it's not J.K. Rowling, is it? Not really, no, no. no. But all right-thinking people would agree, Stephen, you have the most beautiful reading voice anyone has no, ever no, heard. No, 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 bless you. You're very kind. Well, you are quite right, of course. I really am pretty good. <laughs> Martin Jarvis! <laughs> and yet, you're seeing someone else. <laughs> Another narrator. It's not what it looks like, I can explain. No two-timing bastard! Look, there's really no need oh, for... Oh, butt out, pastry face. <laughs> Go and have a twining stew of them. Oh, seriously, Martin, nothing was going on. I remember when you used to tell me how giddy my readings of Just William made you feel. But now all you want is him reading things. Well, I am very good, Martin. Nobody quite articulates the word muggle quite like me. <laughs> Now, why don't you just tootle off to Radio Leicester or something, hmm? <laughs> well, you want someone to read the travel or the weather? Oh, oh, oh boys, 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 this is meant to be a happy No, no, no. <laughs> There's only one way to settle this, the old-fashioned way, with a duel. Oh, for goodness sake. Are you scared? Don't <laughs> scare them a tart like you. You'll be back in Midsummer Murders before I've said Chapter One. <laughs> okay. okay. Choose your weapon, Fry. I choose... Just William gets his own back. I opt for Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Oh, but please, surely we can settle this like grown men without having to resort to book reading. <laughs> Hello, William. Said Violet Elizabeth Bott. I saw what you were doing over the garden fence. <laughs> and I'm going to tell your sister. Harry, Ron and Hermione desperately searched for shelter, and the fearsome winged dragon circled it overhead. It was just then that William took his catapult, Muggle, from his... <laughs> oh dear. Seemed to have Harry lost stumbled my place. and fell heavily no, no, to no, the sodden earth as the dragon swooped. <laughs> News at one o'clock. This is Charlotte Green. Martin Jarvis, famed for his reading of the Just William books, has been arrested by police investigating a break-in at Broadcasting House, where he took scissors and cut up all of Radio 4's best programmes. He claims he was jilted by the network after many happy years together. 
Jarvis is also accused of putting Radio 4's phone number in various personal dating columns, <laughs> accompanied by the words, two-timing wireless whore who'll do it with anyone. <laughs> It is fair to say, is it not, Radio 4, that one programme, more than any other, inspires a passionate response from your listeners. Oh, yes, the story of everyday country folk. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm talking about the archers. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry. The everyday story of shagging incest and murder. Yes. Now, one tradition the show has is to mark major anniversaries by welcoming celebrity guests to Ambridge. Uh, these have included Griff Rees Jones, Victoria Wood, even Princess Margaret. Oh, yes, Princess Margaret was a sweetie, though she was rather disappointed when she found out the pub was fictional. <laughs> I believe that to mark the upcoming anniversary of the millionth time Jill Archer has said, least said, soonest mended on the show, <laughs> you've pulled out all the stops. Oh yes, Stephen, it's a real coat. We've managed to get God. God's an Archer's fan. Oh yes, absolutely. Why do you think he rested on the seventh day? So he could listen to the of other Of course. <laughs> well... Why don't we do some listening to a little sneak preview, eh? Please welcome the cast of The Archers with God. <laughs> Almighty God's the new temporary landlord of the bull. There's a far better class of clientele now, and a lovely new selection of wine. Yeah, but it's coming out the taps and the gents' toilet. <laughs> Him and his bloody miracles. I'm having to wash my hands with Chilean Merlot. <laughs> oh, smart yourself up, Joe. Look, here he comes now. Hello, God. Ah, hello, everyone. Sorry I'm late, it was the traffic. Oh, went through hell getting here. Anyway, I'm looking forward to discussing the EU subsidies for maize and other Arab... I'm sorry, who writes this rubbish? It's the writers, God. They control everything we do. They play with us for their sport. Do they now? Well, perhaps it's time that a guy with real omnipotence shows them who's boss. Oh, you mean the agricultural story editor? No. <laughs> I meant me. <laughs> Don't worry, now I'm here, you'll never have to chat unconvincingly about defra, bird flu, or foot and mouth compensation ever again. What's that noise? Noise? Oh, you mean that music? <laughs> Yes, in my experience, that music usually signals the approach of something hellish, cast up from the bowels of Hades. Oh, uh, hello, Carrie. Hello, Joe. Linda Snow! And who might you be? I am God. Have you ever considered amateur dramatic? <laughs> Harsh, but fair. <laughs> well, I can hardly wait to listen to that. But, of course, it's not just the archers that's often been controversial, is it? Ah, oh, do you mean the first gay kiss on you and yours? <laughs> well, uh, no, no. I, I meant as far back as the 50s when practising homosexuality wasn't the popular and amusing hobby that it is today. <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember Up the Tunnel, starring Kenneth Tunnel? Oh, yes. Yes, who could forget? Mm. <coughs> Hello, I'm Kenneth Tunnel, and who knows what sort of spiffing adventure I'll have this week, as once again I venture Up the Tunnel. Oh, look who I see approaching. It's a couple of fine, upstanding young dandies. Oh, hello, Mr. Tunnel. I'm Mr. Whoopsie, and this is my friend, Mr. Bumfonder. <laughs> no doubt a pair of dashing young blades like you must be fighting the ladies off with sticks. Yes, <laughs> except with we. 
women, but we're gay. <laughs> That's right. We are homosexual men who indulge regularly in acts of sexual intercourse with other homosexual men. <laughs> yeah, it's marvellous. Still, <laughs> I haven't the slightest clue what you're on about, but by Germany, it does sound good, wholesome fun. <laughs> Jim Pip. We should turn now to the infamous Radio 4 phone-in programme. Oh, yes, now, there was a tremendous hullabaloo, wasn't there, when a spoof phone-in that was really only meant to be a laugh was taken seriously by many listeners. Yes, that's right. Even to this day, many people still believe any answers is a real show. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? Some say that it's the only genuinely amusing show to be made by the entertainment department. <laughs> well, we come, like all good things, now... Radio 4, to an end. Is that why Midweek is still going? <laughs> well, we do, however, need something that will complete this quite magnificent evening. Something that would have us leave this superlative celebration of 40 years of Radio 4 and send us all out into the night air full of joy, warmth and laughter. Well, at least we can rest assured that you haven't dragged Nicholas Parsons along then. <laughs> of course not, quite the opposite. We didn't have to drag him, we couldn't keep him away. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Radio 4. I'm here to speak on my chosen subject, Radio 4, for one or maybe even two hours, without hesitation, repetition or deviation. Oh, dear me. Yes, it's Nicholas Parsons. Oh, oh Nicholas, what a shame. There's only 30 seconds left. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons, your subject is Radio 4. This is your life. Your time starts now. Yes, hello and welcome. We come to you this evening from the hallowed confines of the radio theatre here in Broadcasting House in the beating heart of central London from where I'd like to say welcome to everyone listening to on the home Radio 4 and also... <laughs> uh, Radio 4, you challenge? His rambling incoherence. <laughs> Actually, not a legitimate challenge, although you can have a point because the audience clearly loved it. Uh, <laughs> The subject is still yours. You have 20 seconds. And, of course, welcome to those listening on the World Service, those listening via DAB. <laughs> yes, ready for again. Repetition of rambling and gear, I think. <laughs> well, again, correct challenge, but not acceptable within the rules of just a minute. Nicholas, the show's over in 10 seconds. Can you take us to the whistle? Yes. Welcome to all of you listening on the World Wide Web, those of you listening on the Internet, and, of course, those alien life forms in the constellation of Cassiopeia, who's listening on the sound waves bounced of the Hubble Space Telescope. Radio 4, tonight, that was your life! Thank you and good night! This is your live start. Stephen Fry and Matt Lucas and was written by Bill Dare, John Holmes, John Finnamore, Nev Fountain and Tom Jameson. The cast were Dave Lamb, Sue Perkins, Michael Fenton Stevens and Richie Webb. With guest appearances from Rosalind Adams, Rabbi Lionel Blue, Roger Bolton, Carol Boyd, Corey Caulfield, Jonathan Dimbleby, Charlotte Green, John Humphreys, Martin Jarvis, Edward Kelsey, Sue Lawley, Paul Lewis, Sarah Montague, Jenny Murray, James Nopty, Nicholas Parsons and Peter White. The producer was Julia McKenzie. And not forgetting that very special guest in the arches, of course, God, who was played by the very mighty Barry Cryer. <laughs>